Hi, I'm Mike Wood. I'm Professor of Applied Ecology here at the University of Salford. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I do in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, sometimes referred to as the Dead Zone. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what we can learn from this zone. Now, just in case you don't know, the Exclusion Zone is located on the border between the Ukraine and Belarus. On the 26th of April, 1986, about half past one in the morning, there was an accident that happened at Chernobyl reactor number four. That accident caused the roof of the reactor to be blown off, exposing the radioactive core. Over the course of the next 10 days, contamination was released into the atmosphere. That contamination spread in the local area but also spread much more widely and actually reached over into Europe. It's only in the last few years that we've seen restrictions lifted in the UK on the use of some of the animals from our upland farms. There were many people that were evacuated from the local area. About 116,000 people were moved out of the area immediately around the reactor. About 60,000 cattle were also moved out of that area. As a result, we ended up with an area that became known as the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, the Dead Zone, the Zone of Alienation. In terms of the immediate impacts of the radiation, here you see an image which shows an orangey-red coloration to a series of trees, and then quite a sharp transition through to a green coloration. That image is actually showing you a plume of radioactive contamination that has gone through this pine forest area. The radiation levels were so high that it caused death of those pine trees. Now, if you go to that same location and look at the view that you see here, you actually see silver birch trees quite commonly. And that's because birch trees are more resistant to radiation. So there's been this natural succession process this change from dead pine trees through to a surviving birch forest. And you can see that the radiation levels are still quite high. That's 147 microsieverts per hour. That is if you look around some of the abandoned building areas, certainly in the city of Pripyat, you see a very interesting take back of nature. So nature is engulfing these buildings. The trees are growing up through the, the land areas around these buildings and you're seeing a shift from an urban environment back towards much more of a natural environment. What we see in the exclusion zone is an area that's been devastated as a result of an accident but actually an area that we have the opportunity to use as a natural laboratory. We can use this area to study the way in which radiation impacts on wildlife. And we can do this because we have areas with different contamination levels. If you look at this map, you see there's a red area in towards the center where the lake is. That is the area where you have the highest contamination. And as you move out through different colors down to the blue areas down here, some of these blue areas are at the upper end of UK natural background. As a result of that, we have control sites and experimental test sites at different radiation levels. Now, work that's been undertaken in this natural laboratory has resulted in conflicting reports. These conflicting reports have appeared in the scientific literature and subsequently in the press. Here are two examples of articles from the BBC. One of these articles talks about a decline in the species in Chernobyl linked to DNA. So the message is quite clear. There is a reduction in species as a result of DNA damage from radiation. The other article says that wildlife defies Chernobyl radiation. It calls it a haven for wildlife, a nature reserve in anything but name. These are two very different perspectives coming out of the same news organization. And as I say, that's as a result of 
different perspectives being published in the international literature. So what? Why do we care about the fact that there are different perspectives being published about radiation and its impacts on wildlife? Well, we need to put this research into context. We need to recognize the fact that there is a predicted significant increase in the proportion of energy which will be generated from nuclear into our immediate future, certainly within the UK, and also for many nations around the world. We have many operational nuclear power stations. We have construction taking place of deep geological facilities where we can store radioactive waste from our nuclear legacy and also from the ongoing operation of nuclear power stations. Radioactive material isn't just used for power generation, it's used in other ways as well. So nuclear medicine is something which is, again, an extremely important part of the nuclear makeup that we face when we think about discharges into the environment. So all of these things give us sources of radioactive release and there is a need to have appropriate regulations, appropriate policy and appropriate assessment approaches to determine whether or not those human activities are going to result in significant radiation impact on wildlife. Now we were very lucky a few years ago to get funding from the Natural Environment Research Council, the Environment Agency and Radioactive Waste Management Limited to fund a program of research focused within the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone using the area as a true natural laboratory. One of the things that we did as part of that work is we set up motion activated cameras and we set these up in areas of different radiation levels. The idea being that we wanted to investigate how radiation may or may not influence the diversity and abundance of species that we found in these areas. The cameras actually showed us an amazing diversity of wildlife. These are just some of the images that we got. So we saw wild boar, grey wolves, elk, Chevalsky's horses, a very rare species of horse. Lynx, bison, this is actually the first record of one of these bison making their way onto the Ukrainian side of the exclusion zone. And perhaps our most exciting photograph of all is this one. This is probably the first and only bare selfie that you will ever see. This is the animal in question and our cameras actually documented the return of this animal to an environment where it had been reportedly been absent for well over a hundred years. So it's really interesting to see just through our camera records the way in which this environment has evolved. So when you see a headline like this, Chernobyl zone shows decline in biodiversity, and then you see the images that come out of the cameras, you've got to ask whether that's really the case. Now something that we recognize is that biodiversity isn't just about large mammals. Biodiversity is about the diversity of life that's present. So we've been working at Salford with Paul Kendrick. Paul is a specialist in acoustics, and through our work together, we've actually been capturing the Chernobyl soundscape and using that to analyze a broader view of diversity, a broader view of faunal diversity. Because we don't just capture the sounds of large mammals, we capture the sounds of birds, insects, vocalizing amphibians, all of these give us a much more complete picture of the faunal diversity present. Other people at Salford that work with me in different aspects of this, here we have Ross Forks, one of my PhD students. Now, Ross thinks a lot, as you can see from the image, and he's thinking here about work that we're doing with a company called JCS Nuclear Solutions. Now, JCS specialise in radiation detector technology. And actually, Ross's PhD has been about understanding how we measure in a much better way than we've been doing recently the amount of radioactivity that's inside an animal. So conventionally, if you ask a radio ecologist how they measure how much radioactivity is in an animal, they'll tell you this. What we do is we go out into the environment and we capture the animal that we need to measure. 
We then euthanize that animal in some way. We freeze dry it. We blend it. And then we put it onto a detector. All well and good. However, our aim is to protect the environment. If we, to demonstrate that we're protecting the environment, are going out and destroying animals in the process, that's not what we're about. That poses a real ethical consideration for us. So what we want is a detector that we can use where we capture an animal in the environment, we present it to a detector, we count for a short period of time to determine how much radioactivity is present, and then we release that animal. Ross, while sleeping in the back of a car, came up with exactly that type of detector. And I'm delighted to say that that detector is now working, it's been validated, it's proving really exciting for people around the world that there's now this opportunity to use this type of detector for research and indeed compliance monitoring around nuclear licensed sites. And Ross got his PhD on the back of this work. We've also been working with other people at Salford on different aspects of research in the exclusion zone. So, for example, here, back in 2016, there was a big fire in the most contaminated part of the exclusion zone. This fire burnt about 80% of what's known as the Red Forest. And we were, again, lucky enough to get some funding to actually study the post-fire impacts. And that's involved working with Neil Entwistle. Now, Neil specializes in river systems and studies of rivers. So he's not perhaps the immediate person that you think of would be working with me in a terrestrial research program. But actually, Neil uses drones to study rivers. He tries to map out the shape of river systems. And for him, vegetation growing over the top is a real annoyance. He wants to get rid of the vegetation level that's there so that he can see the shape of the river system. So he has a computer program that strips out the vegetation level. I want the opposite. I want to be able to use a drone, fly back and forth over a site, and I want to be able to quantify how much vegetation's there. So what we do is we use his exact same system, but rather than stripping out the vegetation, we strip out the floor. And suddenly we can now quantify how much vegetation is present. We can then relate that to different areas of radiation level and use that to inform an understanding of how radiation affects the, the regeneration of an ecosystem post-fire. We've also been working with other people at Salford. So, for example, working with Professor Andy Meir. Andy specializes in science communication, and he worked with me to help realize a, a public engagement exhibition around our work. The first element of that took place in 2015, and that's then continued since then. And we've worked with people in Salford's Think Lab to develop a virtual reality tour of Chernobyl. So we now have virtual Chernobyl, and we're moving towards virtual Chernobyl 2. We also at Salford are lucky enough to have a team within the Mawson Makerspace. They, again, have been inspired by the Chernobyl work that's taking place and have worked with us to develop a, a large matted area that represents the exclusion zone. They've 3D printed and laser cut different features from within that zone and created an area that we can now fly toy drones over. So people who want to come and learn about our research can also get the experience of actually piloting drones over the exclusion zone. Another one of my PhD students who completed fairly recently was from Thailand. Now, coming from Thailand, he'd not seen an awful lot of snow. I was very impressed when he actually agreed to go and work in an area of Norway where minus 25, 27 degrees is the norm during the winter period. And going to this area of Norway, he actually started to develop a new technology that we were working on, which allows us to measure the external radiation exposure of animals moving around in part of Norway, which was contaminated by cesium from the Chernobyl accident. These animals are reindeer. They are really useful to us because they 
actually had GPS collars on already. So we were able to track their movements because the herders in Norway track the movement of these animals. And all we needed to do was fit our dose measurement technology onto this. This work then expanded to link into Peter Hogg, who's a professor here at Salford that specializes in radiation medicine. And with Peter, we've taken this to another stage where we've actually started to explore the development of a computer model of a deer, where we can very accurately model a map the radiation exposure of internal organs. This model that we're generating, known as a phantom, a voxel phantom in fact, is actually a really useful model, not just from a research perspective, but also from thinking about more broadly, potential ways in which in the future we may wish to model radiation exposure of wildlife. So this work feeds into information of relevance to the International Commission for Radiological Protection. We've also done quite a lot of national and international capacity building based around the work that we do. So we've been running training courses to train regulators, to train consultants who may need to use the kind of dose assessment tools and frameworks that we develop and the science that we're developing to actually inform their practice. Our work has attracted a lot of media interest. We've had work featured within documentaries and also across many different news outlets as well. And I was delighted to hear that we had been shortlisted for the Times Higher Education Research Project of the Year. Not only were we shortlisted, we were the winners as well. So we won, on the basis of our Chernobyl work, that Times Higher Education research project of the year. Now, this is the marketing photo that many people have seen pushed out there. Far fewer people have seen the photograph that one of my colleagues took of me at the time when the winner was announced. As you can see, I was fairly excited at that moment. What's really nice is that wasn't the last of the awards that we received. So earlier this year, I was delighted to be presented with the Founders Medal from the main professional society for radiation protection. That was a really great honor because again, it recognized the contribution of my work and of the, the Chernobyl-based research to the broader field of radiation protection internationally. So I quite often find myself in Chernobyl, looking out over the area, reflecting on what we can gain, what we can learn from studying that region and also thinking about other opportunities to collaborate with people within Salford and more widely on the research that we're undertaking. We currently have, within Salford, a very large number of people that are collaborating on this research. These people are drawn from different schools across the university. So we have people like me from the School of Environment and Life Sciences, but we have people from the Health Sciences, we have people from Computer Science and Engineering, the School of the Built Environment, all coming together at a university level to interact, collaborate, and to deliver this research. That plays very much into the university's research strategy. This fits directly with when one of the university's research beacons around environmental quality, and is a really nice example of how if you bring people together, you can start to deliver some really interesting interdisciplinary research. So that's it from me. Thank you for listening.